All right, today's scripture reading comes from 1 Peter 4, 7 through 13. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, let each other love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something were strange, um, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. I am hot this morning. Okay. In the early days of Monday Night Football, Howard Cosell announced the game, and Don Meredith, a former Cowboy quarterback, was his commentator. He was the, what we called the color man. And every Monday night that I remember watching, somewhere in the fourth quarter, when the, outcame, when the outcome of the game was finally apparent, Don Meredith would sing a little song. Do you old timers remember that song? Turn out the lights, the party's over. <laughs> I guess all good times must end. It was Don Meredith's cowboy way of saying the end of this game is at hand. The end of this game is at hand. This morning, we're beginning the All Things sermon series with the verse from 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Pretty ominous words. And sadly, they rather fit our country's current situation. A brief survey could have us singing, turn out the lights. Consider these. Our government has accumulated over $31 trillion in debt. That's 25% more than what our entire economy produces each year. Our economy being the largest in the world. And the Washington Post recently projected that our deficit this year will be well over twice what it was last year. Is the end of all things at hand? The false gospel of sexual expression has quadrupled the number of young people claiming to be transgender or gender fluid. Easy access to pornography has fueled a market for sex trafficking in this country. Innocence is poorly guarded, and identity has been treated like a game for children to play. Is the end of things, of all things, at hand? And speaking of poorly guarded, someone posted this, sneaking into a country doesn't make someone an immigrant any more than breaking into a house makes you part of the family. Is the end of all things at hand? This last one. China's Communist Party is the Bible's Assyria or Babylon in our day. They have been responsible for killing many tens of millions of their own people. 
They've bought up land here. They've stolen patented and secret technology, established effective spy networks. They also possess highly advanced hypersonic missiles, which are likely built from technologies we started to develop years ago but abandoned. They've shown they're willing to use biological warfare. What else are they? Our political enemy, but our largest trading partner, willing to do to us? Is the end of all things at hand? I certainly hope not. But it is increasingly clear to me that unless more citizens get more involved with these and other problems, we in this country and the next generations are in for a rough ride. I hope I haven't made any of you anxious. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I hope you are just a little bit. I wanted to tap into this because I want us to take seriously the words of Scripture. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, as we see strange and unhealthy things take hold. We pray that you would truly become anchored in us as the one living hope for which we will live. And in your name, serve the world that needs you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the end of all things is at hand. Who wrote that? The Apostle Peter, St. Peter. It was written by him from Rome only a few years before he was executed under Nero. And he wrote to warn the faithful in Asia Minor, that's modern-day Turkey, that the heat was being turned up and to adjust to the difficulties in a way that would make Jesus proud. The reading began, the end of all things is at hand, but he doesn't exactly explain what that means. In his mind, it would be self-evident to the folks he was writing to. But to the modern reader, what he means is not terribly clear. It reminds me of the time that there were these two pastors in a small town sitting together out on the side of a little highway holding a sign. The sign read, the sign read, the end is near. Repent and turn around. A car came down the highway and slowed as the pastors pointed to the sign, but the driver sped up and kept driving, rounding a curve as he did. Seconds later, there was a, there was a screech of tires followed by a big splash. And one of the pastors said to the other, yeah, that's the second one this morning. Do you think we just should have written the bridge is out? Okay. And to someone on the go, the warning signs are not necessarily clear. But one thing is clear that what Peter wrote in his epistle is what all the other apostles were in some way saying. To the Philippians, St. Paul wrote, the Lord is at hand. Philippians 4, 5. James wrote, the coming of the Lord is at hand. James 5, 8. John says the days in which his people are living are the last hour. That's 1 John 2, 18. And yet all that was nearly 2,000 years ago. And there are many for whom all such passages are problematic. If taken Literally, in one way, the New Testament writers were mistaken about the second coming of Christ. Well, we can, we can look at such passages in a variety of ways. Uh, one could be, well, they were mistaken about the time. The events they looked for did not take place when they thought they would. And we should recall that Jesus said, no one knows about that day or hour not even the angels, nor the Son, but only the Father. William Barclay wrote, The curious thing about this 
is that over time, the Christian church allowed these words to stand, even though they could have deleted them before the New Testament canon was finished being put together. The clear con conclusion is that the early church continued to believe these words to be true, even though Jesus had not returned yet in the way that he had foretold. There are many today here in this church that feel certain that Jesus' second coming is most imminent. And how can he delay with the world the way it is? And believe me, I, I understand. I also long for his return, but I'm not convinced it's going to be as soon as some of you think. And then there's this other line of thinking that holds that the end has already come. That God's history was fulfilled in Jesus' incarnation. That in him, time was invaded by eternity. In him, the prophecies were all fulfilled. If we accept this interpretation, it means that the end of history has already come and only the last remnants of evil remain to be finished off. This used to be a common view. The trouble with it is that it flies in the face of one terrible fact. Evil is as rampant as ever. So what is it? Perhaps our nearness to the end is simply the truth of our spiritual condition. Maybe we say the end is near because we see so clearly the need for God to intervene. We have to acknowledge the futility of man trying to fix man. And as we survey the condition of our nation, we think, surely God must intervene. Surely judgment must come against such evils and craziness. In any case, the need for repentance and faith and revival is urgent. And now we're getting close to the heart of what Peter was saying. So let me help you get all the way out of the water and tell you what the bridge is that will move us to the other side. In the New Testament's language, the word for the end is telos. In English lettering, T-E-L-O-S. And it means the goal or the fulfillment. If you're watching a football game and it's the fourth quarter and there's two minutes left, you know the end is near. But it's not just the cessation of the game. It's not just the game being over. It's also the outcome. And that's where all the excitement is. It's when you figure out who's going to win. And if it's your team that's winning, guess what? You're pumped. So... The end means the fulfillment or the completion. And at hand means close by, near, within your reach. It's the same phrase Jesus used when he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. So, <clears throat> Coach Peter was telling his players, his, his, his readers, it's the fourth quarter. And the fulfillment of all things is within our reach. For Christians, the end, though lively, it's a beautiful thing. The song that Don Meredith sang was not a Christian song. That song went, turn out the lights, the party's over, I guess all good times must end. Turn out the lights, the party's over, and tomorrow if you know the song, we'll do the same old thing again. Ooh, ooh. Christians don't do the same old thing again when we know that all things are about to be fulfilled. We change. We become 
transformed. We get it in gear. We come alive in Christ. For if, God, if God's judgment is right in front of our world, so also is the hope of the promised new creation. The hope of sharing in Christ's glory. The hope of God putting all things right. So the end is actually necessary to usher in God's deepest hope for his creation. And it's really big stuff. Romans 8.21 says, with eager hope, the whole creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. All creations looking forward to this. And down on the home field in real time for Peter, persecutions have erupted in Rome and Peter knew they would spread. Even so, Peter is not afraid not overreaching, not self-serving, and certainly not offended. And why? Because he has experienced God's victory in Christ Jesus. He saw the glorious one who had been dead. He knew and communed with the dear one who said, I have overcome the world. So continue, excuse me, Peter continued to be who Jesus had called him to be. He continued to be inspired using the authority Christ gave him, calling Jesus' people to reveal the Messiah's character to the world and sharing what he had learned and observed. He knew that Caesar wasn't Lord. Jesus was. And we who have come to know Jesus by faith are also to be inspired using the authority Christ gives us to reveal his character, sharing what we've learned and observed. Are you ready for that? It's going to require a shifting of gears. Let me help. I want you to imagine something. What if we all knew for sure that the world was going to end in a week. I mean, like, like maybe a huge asteroid was barreling through space heading right towards Corpus Christi. What would you do? What would your week be filled with? I can tell you what you wouldn't do. You wouldn't order more cooking magazines. You wouldn't be checking your portfolio. You wouldn't be doing your math homework. You wouldn't mow your yard. You wouldn't worry about what you were wearing so much. You wouldn't be taking pictures with all your, with, with, uh, your friends on the phone. And you wouldn't spend time scrolling. I think you would be with your people, loving them, serving them. I hope you would reconcile with those you were at odds with. I pray you would pray for your soul and even more for those who really needed to experience God's grace and mercy. And you would tell them about it. And you would tell people that you love them and that God loves them. And you would be kind to strangers and hospitable. I think you might read the Gospels just to get super clear on Jesus who was God in the flesh. Many of you would be spokespersons for God. I know you would. And you'd make Coach Peter proud. But more importantly, the Lord himself. If you knew your time was at hand. Let me tell you a story I read about this week. In the most recent issue of The Voice of the Martyrs, they showcased the persecution of believers in southern Mexico. Now, Mexico's constitution guarantees freedom of religion, but it also allows native peoples a degree of self-governance to practice their own uses and customs. And under the uses and customs law, some village leaders only allow for their villages traditional religions. So Ruth and 
Aurelio possess a passion for evangelism, giving out Bibles, planting small churches. They and others like them are generally ostracized. Where they live, their electricity often gets cut off. Their children aren't allowed to attend the local schools. They're denied medical care, etc. And they get threatening phone calls sometimes. They say they're used to it. They just lean on the Lord more and more. Well, six years ago, I read, as their family was driving home from a mission trip, they were cornered by a truck and car. Six masked men climbed out with automatic rifles. Okay, this is serious, people. These were rebels of the, of the Zapatista Army of National Liberation. They were masked, and they said, we know who you are, we know what you do, and today, because you've been warned, you're going to die. And they beat Aurelio terribly, and they doused the others with gasoline. Ruth explained to them, they give Bibles. They don't make money. They don't threaten people. They make people's lives better. They teach children to read. You must stop it, a man shouted. And she said, we have to do this. Her resilience unsettled them. As time grew by, went by and it grew dark, Ruth felt God's presence settle in on her. And then she clearly heard him say, you won't die. You will live and you will tell of my glory. In that moment, she felt an inexplic inexplicable peace and a strength came over her. But suddenly, one of the captors put a gun to her head and squeezed the trigger. But the gun jammed, and he couldn't get it to work. Frustrated, he tried to light a match to burn them alive, but the matches would not light. And the man was clearly rattled. They all began arguing among themselves what they should do. And they finally agreed to steal the vehicle and all their things. And they left them with a strict warning. Do not tell the police. We know where you live. Now, I don't want to sugarcoat this. This was a really traumatic thing to happen to them. It took Aurelio time to heal and for all of them to recover from the trauma. With humility, the couple admits there are many questions we don't have answers to that we don't know, but we do know that God saved us with his mercy and that it is worth taking these risks for his gospel. Since that event six years ago, since that event, through an expanding network of volunteers, those two people have helped plant more than 500 churches. And they have established nearly 50 outreach bases that reach three indigenous people groups. They tell the people of their Lord's glory. They are overcomers. And that's the vocation the Word of God is calling us to this morning, to be overcomers with Christ. So what am I trying to say in this first sermon in our All Things series? I'm saying that Christians who live a countercultural lifestyle in order to follow Jesus should not be surprised if the culture around them responds with some hostility. There's going to be misunderstanding, discrimination, Mockery, trumped up charges, and even violence. That's what happened to Jesus 
Why should it be any different for his people? But keep blessing. People wrote in, Peter wrote in verse 13, rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. You see, Ruth and Aurelio experienced God's glory just a bit when that gun jammed and those matches wouldn't light and his presence was there to protect them. The closer we are to the end, the more power and beauty we will see as courage and hope increase. What does the Bible say? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? So like Ruth and Aurelio, <coughs> we want to be resilient. We want to be brave. That's what God's true children have been doing since the church began. So hold on today to what St. Peter told the church. In all things, be self-controlled and sober-minded. We're moving through the next verses now. Pray deeply. Love one another earnestly. Befriend the stranger without grumbling. Pray and speak and serve one another in such a way that in everything, Christ himself is shining through his people. Can you imagine that right now? Christ shining through you when things are really rough. Do it. I can imagine that in you. Imagine that in you right now. Knowing that Jesus will help make this happen, Peter ends his passage with praise. He says, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let me invite the musicians and <clears throat> prayer ministers to come forward. As we prepare to enter into our time of prayer ministry to one another, we'll have couples all around the perimeter who are willing to pray for you and they want to for any, any need or concern. But I also want us to think about <clears throat> what the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 4.4. He wrote, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under Jewish law, so that we who believe might receive adoption as sons and daughters. So two things. One is the fullness of time is a very real thing. Don't imagine that Christ is not coming again. He is. It's a real thing. But also, <clears throat> I want you to think of the importance of being adopted into God's family. I don't need to remind you that no one gets out of this world alive. No one. None of us knows the day or the hour or the manner in which we shall meet the Lord face to face. So if you have not received God's gift of salvation but you'd like to. If you don't have an exciting faith-based relationship with Jesus, if you haven't surrendered and trusted him with your whole life and you're ready to now, I want you to come to one of the prayer ministers and get her done. Let them pray for you. There is no more important reason for our being here this morning.